Sarah Hales has led a diverse life which has instilled in her strength and resilience. From growing up on her parents' cattle property to mining engineer, Sarah now runs her own online fashion boutique and podcast. But 11 years ago, when Sarah began having a problem with one of her eyes, is when her true strength and courage came to the fore. I hope you enjoy Sarah's story. Incidentally, after our chat, I had the opportunity to shop in Sarah's little boutique and came away with this beautiful top, among a few other things. Sarah did tell me not to feel obligated, but Sarah, I don't think I've ever felt obligated to buy things when they're so pretty but I know that that will be a really good excuse for future reference. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing your beautiful story. Sarah, thank you so much for joining me. And I've been really looking forward to talking to you and I've got lots I want to talk to you about, but I want to tell people who you are first because you're a bush girl, but you love to be on the beach. Mm -hmm. And um, so tell us a bit about your background. Well, um, I grew up on a cattle property. all of my life and I I absolutely love that part of my life. It is, I guess, the core foundation of who I am, but not only myself, but all the other members of my family really enjoy going to the beach and we enjoy surfing or wakeboarding. So yeah, we don't mind a holiday to it's, Noosa or... <laughs> it's like two ends of the spectrum because I know your Uncle Bill yeah. and he is such a bushy and the most unlikely surfer yeah that I've I ever met, but yeah. it's really amazing it runs. I don't know how it came to be but it seems to have infiltrated all of us really yeah. so wow. it's so nice the beach is beautiful but the bush is. is lovely too I think I'm a water baby I think I think it's the water because I, I really don't love sand <laughs> <laughs> so Sarah when you left school you studied engineering and you had a mining career for a while I did I did it didn't go that smoothly. I went to university in Brisbane, but, um, you know, because I was a bush girl and I'd gone to uh, to school in Rockhampton, going to Brisbane was probably just a little bit of a step further than I wanted to take at that time. So I came home and I worked for a while and I ended up in an administration job in the mines. Mm -hmm. And it was then that I thought, actually, I've got more to offer. And I went back and I was doing my engineering you know, secretively, I guess, by correspondence. And I was a little, I was so young that I was worried that if my boss found out that I was studying on the side, that he'd be really disappointed that I wasn't focused on my work. And when he, well, it's Darren Hamblin. And when he actually found out, he, um, he was thrilled and they like helped me and supported me through that and mm. then used my skills to then go on, um, you know, to management positions mm. within the company. So, it couldn't have turned out better when I was quite worried that I was going to get in trouble. <laughs> that is so funny, isn't it? When we're young yeah. Yeah. and, um, yeah, we just worry so much and and yeah. probably that drives us not to be honest in a way, you know. Like, yeah. yeah. Well, I was doing it at night and on the weekends and that sort of thing and I was worried, you know, not doing it during work hours, of course, and worried that I didn't want the two to cross over and for anybody to think that I wasn't focused on what I was doing. But yeah. You know, they couldn't have been happier. That is so funny, Sarah. Yeah. Gosh, and especially knowing the Hamlins too. Yeah. But, um, so you, once you married and had your little family, yeah. you started your own little business. I did. So tell yeah. me about West of the Waves because you have so, beautiful things. Oh, that- thank you. Um, West of the Waves, the name, I guess, says it all because it's that cowgirl part of me and the beach part of me and it's how we dress and it's how I combine, you know, those two elements of my life, I guess. But previously in my mining career, I worked a lot of hours, 14-hour days a lot of the time with the travel and whatever and I lived away in a mining camp and I just knew once I'd had Jack that I wasn't going to do that again. It wasn't that I was going to turn my back on mining but I wasn't going to go and live in a camp site and be away um, from my yeah. baby. But I also knew that if I didn't um, do something, I guess, with my mental energy, and I sometimes liken it to exercise, like if somebody has got physical energy that they need to burn off, they can go for a run. And I just felt like I had all this mental energy because I was used to using my brain so much um, and I needed to find a way to do something. So I. My brother 
said to me, I'm sick of hearing about all the stuff you can't do. <laughs> because I must have been saying, I can't do this and I can't do that. And um, he said, I only want to hear about what you can do. So he challenged that's me to set so up a website. So I did. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah, so I, can't, I did it very back to front. I set up the website, which was, I guess, the first challenge to see whether or not I actually had the skills to set up the website. And then once that was done, I was already feeling a lot better yeah. because I, you know, had completed a task. And at that point, my website was live. You could, if you wanted to go there and buy something, you could. The bank account details were all in there. It was completely set up. Did you have anything to buy? Well, no. I didn't even have a, I didn't even have a name. Jack on there. <laughs> could no. have sold him. <laughs> oh, oh, that is um, so funny. I didn't even have the name. So then I thought I, I got to thinking, well, you know, I better name this thing because it's out there now. Like I'm not just going to waste what I've done. So I came up with the name and then I found a product after that. Mm -hmm. And then my products have just been, um, you know, a natural progression as well. So I originally found some beautiful bangles and then I started making some of my own jewellery and then I found some clothes and then I started making my own clothes. And now we have an in-house label. It's 100% designed by me, 100% Australian made. We have the licence to put the green and gold triangle on it. And wow. yeah, we're just going ahead. Yeah. So it's the label is West of the Waves. It is West of the yeah. Waves, yeah. So what sort, like all linen still? All linen at this point, yeah. but I am, uh, I do love a really nice cotton. Mm. I guess, you know, it's just a progression to start off with. I thought, can I actually do this, mm. you know, and what? what is it that I'm looking to buy that I can't find? So they're all essentially pieces that I would wear myself and features that I like. Being so tall, I like my dresses to be a bit longer. I like everything with a pocket. So, but yeah, I am looking into some beautiful printed cottons and some more ginghams and that sort of thing. So we're like always trying to move ahead and add new styles, but it's just slowly, slowly. Sarah, did you find, because I always find once you start something, if you don't have the answers straight away, they come to you and yeah. and it's revealed. It's like um, yeah. the big reveal, you know, it's yeah. revealed. Things are revealed as you move through, move through on that path. Did you yeah. find that? I think, and I think even, even the starting of the business was a reveal in itself because whilst I was working, 80 hour weeks or, you know, whatever crazy things I was doing. I didn't have the mental space to do it. Mm. And probably for, I, I would say at least five years before I started my business, mm. I wanted to, I, I would think about it and mm. think, you know, I'd really like to do something for myself. But I had myself convinced that I couldn't set up my own website. I'd even started before I'd gone to like website building platforms and had a bit of a muck around, but I'd never gotten to the point where, I started mm. and I watched this little clip actually in that, you know, time when Will said to me, just get onto it, um, which was that lady called Mel Robbins. I don't oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The, um, where she counts backwards, yeah. five, four, three, two, one, and then take action mm -hmm. because you're like short circuiting your brain or sort of tricking yourself because your brain is set up to um, keep you safe. Mm. So if you... If you start thinking about something and it makes you anxious, then your brain will start saying, oh, you can't do that. You know, that'll, that'll be too hard. Or you'll look silly or you won't be able to do it or you don't have the skills. Whereas if you do this five, four, three, two, one, and then do it, mm -hmm. you will, you know, trick yourself in not allow yourself to have those um, protective yeah. thoughts. Yeah. So I had watched that clip right before I started and I started doing that right then. Mm. Okay, I don't actually know how to do this. Okay, five, four, three, two, one, Google it. Mm. And then yes. I would just try and take some kind of action. Yeah. yeah. Um, because I was going to ask you, was fear part of what held you back? Because we, um, we're fearful of what other people think. We're fearful of yeah. if people are going to think we're silly for doing oh, it and think, yeah. oh, what does, who does she think she is? She can't do that. Yeah, who so, does she think she is? She's not a fashion designer. <laughs> Half so, the time I look terrible in my, you know. Oh, that no, <laughs> is not true, Sarah. I have never, ever seen you oh, look terrible. Ever. Thank you. Oh. Um, 
Yeah, but but was that part of it? Like I think so. Yeah. Even when I did find my product, I guess I started with 20, 20 bangles, and when I was you know working with the ladies that make them for me, I was making styles that I knew that. I could give to my sister or my mother or when it inevitably failed because nobody bought anything. <laughs> I'd be giving away bangles as presents for the rest of my life. Oh, no, but another Sarah present. <laughs> another bloody bangle. So, um, and how did you go about telling Brian, your husband, like, <clears throat> was he supportive? Were you a bit scared to tell him oh, of your idea or...? I did a lot of it when he was at work because Jack was so small. Like Jack was probably only five months old when I started and he was still in that, you know, eat, sleep routine and I would put him in his little Moses basket up on the table and, um, you know, maybe if he slept for an hour then I would work on it then. Uh, so I think I had the website, like I, I actually had the website 100% built um, in 24 hours mm. and then it was you know the name and that sort of thing mm. came afterwards but I told Brian little bits here and there but he had actually started um a little business just before we got married so he has he loves to go crabbing and fishing and he wanted his own uh, fishing shirt like a 50 plus sun protection mm. so he had already designed his own mm. so um yeah, he was very supportive. Yeah. He's, yeah, just something different but similar. Yeah, <clears throat> that's fantastic because yeah. that can always, you know, the support or or lack of support that you get from your partner can play yeah. a big role in the yeah. success or, or, you know, the whether to keep going or not as well. I yeah, guess, I so. think um, because for me, I love it so much. I don't mind doing it at night or on the weekend because yeah. it's not a hobby. It's a genuine business. But whereas something in your mining career might have been hard and then you find ways to avoid it because, oh, my God, that's going to be so hard. I don't know what I'm doing or mm. whatever. Yeah. Um, and that's not necessarily enjoyable. Whereas with this, even though it might be hard, it's really enjoyable. Yeah. So I can do it at night or on the weekends. And sometimes when he comes home from work, he sees that as work. And I'm mm. like, no, I'm really enjoying myself. I'm mm. happy to you know, use my spare time to do this. So mm. there was a period where I thought he really hated it. But just recently I had a, uh, an issue with my social media. My social media got hacked and I was very like, oh, God, should I just, I'll just shut it down, Brian, like I'll just get rid of it. And he said, no, don't, don't do that. You've put so mm. much effort into oh. it and I know that you love it. And that's when I was thought, okay, he, I knew he was on board, but that's when I knew that he really, really was on board. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's, that's so good to have that support. Yeah, it's great, yeah. Um, so, Sarah, the main reason I want to speak to you today yeah. is about your eye injury because mm. um, <clears throat> we were at Beef Week and we were talking about it and you said to me, I don't want this to be wasted. And I just thought that was such a powerful statement mm. um, because, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> I guess we get used to how we look and then something happens and we don't look the way we used to. We used to. And, um, you know, if we look a little bit different, I, I just think coming to terms with that and owning it helps so many people from, mm -hmm. from two different perspectives. It helps people who might go through a similar thing, but it helps people accepting differences in us as well, I yeah. think. So you talking about it... Um, and your journey with it is so important, I think, yeah. in helping people. So tell me how the journey, like how it started, what happened? Well, um, I had a pterygium on my eye, which is not uncommon. So how long ago? Well, I don't even remember. Well, the operation um, was almost 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. So... Um, a pterygium is caused by the sun and being outside in the elements. So I spent all of my child, well, you know, well into my 30s working 
either outside on a cattle property, in the sun, in the dust, down the yards, but also I worked underground in a coal mine. So loads of dust and um, elements and whatever down there as well. So I had this pterygium and it was quite uh, dry and itchy and it would get red and, um, but I didn't have any uh, turning of my eye or drooping of my eyelid or anything like that to look at. It was just sometimes if we were at a camp draft and I'd been out in the sun all day or it was dusty, it would be pretty red. Anyway, I booked in to go and have that removed. Um, and almost immediately after I had it removed, I noticed that my eyelid was like just a little bit down, I guess, but my eye was still straight ahead. And this, this happened when I was about 28. Um, so I went back to the doctor and I talked to him about it and, um, you know, they said they hadn't done anything wrong and whatever. And then I ended up getting a referral and we went down to the Eye Institute in Brisbane. And I remember exactly when it was. It was my mom, it was the Anzac Day long weekend because it was my mum and dad's 30th wedding anniversary. And Alex and I, my sister and I, um, were taking them out to dinner in Brisbane for their wedding anniversary. And um, yes, yeah, so we went to the Eye Institute and I had had to wait five months for my appointment to see this top specialist. And we went into the appointment and you've got to remember that at that stage, the actual like visual appearance of what had happened to my face was um, quite minimal. I mean, I knew it, mum knew it, but to, to the average person, it wasn't that obvious. It has significantly, like very gradually, but significantly deteriorated over 10 years. So anyway, we're at the, doc at the doctor's surgery in Brisbane and um, this specialist said to me, you know, he did a few checks and he said, I can't actually see anything wrong with surgery or anything that might have caused this but if you can just wait a minute i'm going to go and get my colleague and um you know see whether or not i can book you in with an appointment with him so when he left the room i was saying to him oh god we're gonna to have to come back how long is this gonna take mm -hmm. had to wait five months for this guy and he came back in and said oh he's gonna see you in 20 minutes oh gosh so we waited back in the waiting room and then we went into this guy and um and he said, uh, we saw him and whatever, and he said, I need to get you in for a brain scan. So we went, you know, we waited for that while his secretary uh, tried to make arrangements. And he said, I've got you in at the Brisbane Martyr tonight at 11.45 p.m. And I just said to him, I said, I... I know that you cannot clear the schedule at the Brisbane Martyr for me to have a brain scan like that. Like, can you just at least tell me what it is that you're looking for? And he said, um, we're looking for a brain tumour. Um, no, he said, we're testing you for multiple sclerosis and we're also seeing if there are any tumours which would be a better diagnosis because there's something that we could do about that, whereas there's just not a lot that they could do if it was MS. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I mean, that was pretty traumatic, oh, obviously. Yeah, yeah. And um, so we went through all of that and I don't have MS and I don't have a brain tumour. Um, but following that, there was, you know, every other kind of test you could ever imagine I've had. Uh, a lumbar puncture where they take spinal cord fluid. I actually ended up having brain scans every six months for five years, I think. I saw an MS specialist, mm. um, had a nerve conduction study where they um, essentially they put um, electrodes on you and they zap certain parts of your body to test your nerve response to see how your nerves fatigue and see if that's, um, you know, in line with what is normal. And that was normal. Um, beautiful Graham Acton, who's obviously a friend of ours, he got a referral to through a friend to a specialist in Melbourne and I went to see him and um, he was unable to enlighten me on 
anything either. So realistically, um, I've had test after test after test and no one can tell me why. Even to this day? To this day. So, Sarah, what about the sight? Do you still have sight in it? Well, if I cover my eye, mm. this one just comes straight back. Oh, it does too. So it's almost like it's a, yeah. it's a disconnect between the two hemispheres of your brain because I don't know, I'm not a doctor, mm. but I've talked to all of these people yeah. over the time, oh, so yeah. I'm probably like paraphrasing. Um, but, you know, essentially there, there would have been a time when maybe they weren't working together so well and your brain says... Um, this is unsafe, we'll just cut that one out. I mean, your brain is so incredibly smart and, mm. you know, just amazing um, that, yeah, I can see, I can see fine. Mm. And, um, but it obviously has just, you know, overridden that to do the thing that's safest for your body, I guess. Mm. Mm. So. so, Sarah, like, um, were you with Brian? No. No, so he came along after this happened. Yeah. So was that even in your mind, like as your face was changing? Did you, did yeah. like emotionally, you know, did you think no one will ever, yeah. you know? I thought all even those though, things. Like to me, you're still the most beautiful, <laughs> one of the most beautiful looking women. And, but I, I just know when, when you change yourself and you look, you know, you look a little different to what you used to. Can, so, yeah. I, I absolutely thought all of those things. And I was thinking about this last night, just briefly, um, that I guess, yeah, I had all those thoughts. No one, no one will love me. Who would want to go out with somebody that looks like that? All of those thoughts. But I guess in a way, when I met and then married Brian, it's kind of like the relationship was just that little bit deeper because I knew that he genuinely loved me. Mm. Like that wasn't even an issue for him. It was never, never discussed. It's just part of who I am and mm. he doesn't care. Mm. Mm. It almost makes the relationship a little bit sweeter because of it, because I know that it's no problem for him. Mm. Mm. And I guess it, it show it, it proves to pe so many people that there is, you know, it's not about what we look like, you know, and, and you know, as we age too, you know, probably I worry about ageing, you know, yeah. and and you look back at photos of yourself when you were younger and you think, oh, wow, you know. Yeah. But, um, yeah, there's so much more to us, isn't there, than... Yeah, there is. There really is. And I was never like that. I didn't... I've never cared about what somebody looked like, how fat, how skinny, how tall, how short. It does not bother me at all. If you're a nice, kind person, mm. then, you know, I've, I've always been like that. But I think sometimes too, like when I was younger, and I was, I was really beautiful when I was younger. Oh, I really you, was. You still are. <laughs> Thank you. But I think I didn't appreciate it as much. And there also is that element of when you are like a pretty girl, you sort of wonder like, you know, do these go, are they taking me seriously? Or I don't know, I suppose yeah. too in my mining career, I was always surrounded by so many men who were amazing. Like I've, I've loved them and I've had such a great um, working career, but sometimes I'm like, are these people taking me seriously? Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Because, um you know, well, there's three girls in your family yeah. and your mum and, like, I've known your mother for a long time and she's very elegant and, and mm. beautiful but her intelligence shines through yeah. more so than anything else mm. and I think she's, in, like, imparted that onto you three girls yeah. as well. Yeah, she definitely has. So, and so has Dad, though. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. Dad's always, yeah. um, you know, we've worked outside with him very physically and he's he says thing he has said things to us over the years about you know you might work outside with the boys but you don't need to look like them like you know if we didn't have a hairbrush properly which which we would never do but <laughs> <laughs> if we ever came out looking scruffy or whatever he was on to us just as yeah. much as mum was yeah yeah mm. but yeah it's interesting that you think as a 
a beautiful looking girl that people wouldn't take your intelligence seriously because just from my experience knowing your family and that's the you know starting with your mum that's the thing that you know she's beautiful but she's also very intelligent you mm. know yeah, and, she is. and that um yeah is there for everybody to see so um so we, we were talking before about how comfortable you have been you know showing your face and you've worn glass you wear sunglasses yeah. a lot and yeah, I wear sunglasses a lot because what people maybe don't realise is that post the surgery, my eyes are so sensitive to the light, but I do feel like it's a bit of a security blanket. I'd much prefer to go somewhere during the day when I can wear my glasses or whatever. Obviously, with my shop, I have to do a lot of promotion on social media and that sort of thing. And sometimes it's easier because I am outside with the kids a lot. But sometimes it's just easier to do that with my glasses on. Yeah. Don't get as many questions, I suppose. So when you say questions, who asks you questions? Kids or adults? Or? Um, sometimes adults, but mainly kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. mainly yeah. kids. Yeah, kids are honest. Kids are really so honest. So what is what is how? What are some of the things they say, and how do you respond? I, um. You know, they just say what happened to your eye or, yeah. you know, and I'll just say I had an, you know, I had an injury. Yeah. And most of the time that's enough for them. They just want you, they just want to know. They just, yeah. they just want to ask what They're happened. They're curious, aren't they? There they are. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know what I think will be really interesting when your kids get older? They'll probably, you will find that they don't even know that they don't know now. Yeah, that, they don't that's, know. it's interesting, isn't it, how they yeah. grow up seeing you a certain way so there's nothing different and they just, yeah. yeah, it's no big deal. And lots of people who are very close to me um, say that they don't notice. Mm. They don't even notice mm. um, anymore. So it's only if we're talking about it or whatever that they you know, might uh, comment on how, you know, if there's been an improvement or if I look tired or whatever. It's almost like the emotions are written on my face. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sarah, talking about improvement. So you went to see Ken Ware, who's a former Mackay yeah. man and yeah. um, lives at the Gold Coast now. So tell me about Ken, what he does and what he's done for you. And um, So... As it all turned out, Ken actually went to school with my mother. So, you know, I've known who he was for a long time. And somebody else that I know, her fiancé broke his back and he had been going to see Ken. He's a paraplegic and he's been getting some amazing results from the treatment that they do, which is called neurophysics. And I finally got the courage to ring Emma and ask her about it. And then she told me that it was Ken and... I asked mum and, you know, bloody blah, blah, so I ended up down there. And like I said earlier, this has been going on for about 10, 11 years. And I was seeing the MS specialist for about five years. And after I went to the specialist in Melbourne that Graham had arranged for me, um, I just made a decision that I wasn't going to continue to pursue um, that type of treatment because I think that emotionally it was almost making me feel worse because they couldn't find anything and they kept doing more tests and I was just being poked and prodded and not getting anywhere. So I just made a decision that within myself I was just going to try and get on with it mm -hmm. and just, you know, find a way to live with it and move on. So for probably almost four years I didn't do anything. I just... Um, worked on myself I guess and tried to be okay with it and then I found out about Ken and I went to the Gold Coast um, for his intensive therapy program and that is the first time that I've seen any improvement at all in the last 10 years. Mm. So, so what sort of things was he getting you? Um, so their program is exercise based. So there are no fancy exercises that I couldn't do, you know, just over at the local gym, but it's a tremor based therapy. So they're sort of tapping into your body's natural ability to heal. 
but a lot of the things that they work on are your posture. They don't do any exercises where, you know, you're lifting one arm, then lifting the other arm. Everything is together aimed at getting those two sides of your brain working together. It's a lot of uh, like emotional work as well, I suppose, in a sense, in that, you know, um, just, you know, feeling the feelings, not trying to change the past, just thinking of where you are now and um, feeling strong and thinking positively and, um, you know, trying to move forward with things. I don't want to do it any um, disservice with my description of it, but from my point of view, they didn't, they didn't touch me. They instructed me on how to do the exercises. I do the exercises myself. There's been no surgeries. There's been no medications. I've literally um, done the exercises and have seen an improvement. Mm -hmm. So they use very light weights and they use machines. So, you know, the exercise machines, not the free weight sort of thing, so that you're in a, um, a, a grid of movement, I mm -hmm. guess, so there's not all that freedoms of movement. And it's almost like, you, you set yourself up like mentally, physically um, and apply a small amount of stress to your system in the form of the exercise and then you deal with that stress and then you do that repetitively with the exercise. You might sit there and do 10 of them and then you, you move away from that exercise and move on to the next one. So you apply a little tiny bit of stress to your system and you sit with it and you think about your reaction to it because when you then leave the gym, having had a stress and then dealt with it, you're then moving away from that in a like a much better emotional, physical, mental state. Mm to then move on to the next task. And if you continuously do that day after day after day, you begin to see improvements. Mm. That is, it is amazing. So uh, on a, say, percentage basis, how what percentage of improvement do you think you've seen? Oh, I wouldn't know, um, like only a few percent. Yeah. But I actually think that it has changed my life because it hasn't just been the physical like the visual improvement that I can see and that my family can see. Mm. I've taken progress photos. Yeah. So you can see that yeah. there's been an improvement. But how I handle other stresses or how I might conduct myself has actually gotten better as well. So it's not yeah. it's not they're not just working on your one specific injury. All of their in all of their exercises are whole of body. So it infiltrates into other parts of your life as well. But it's so interesting, isn't it? And yeah. um, Sarah, I'm so grateful to you for talking about it all, um, you know, your feelings and your journey that you've been on with your eye because I honestly believe it does break down barriers and, and uh, as I said before, you know, there's in, in two particular ways in helping somebody else and, and in having other people accept differences in people so um yeah i'm really really grateful to oh, you, you. And, and well like i said to you when we we're at beef week i feel like there was a time when i like retracted back into myself i guess and it's probably through having the kids that i don't want to do that i, I don't want them to see me like that i don't want them to think that that's how you behave i guess or I just want to be a better example for them. But also it's been pretty traumatic and I don't mm. want it to be wasted, I guess. I feel like I'm on the healing part of it now, I guess. I feel like I, uh, rather than somebody else going through the, going through it on their own or um, I, don't, I don't know what it is, but I feel like I have to share it. I almost feel like a responsibility to talk about it so that somebody else, if somebody else gets something out of it, then it, it won't have just been like a rubbish time in my life. It will have been valuable to somebody else, yeah. if that makes sense. I that's, hope it does. That's a wonderful 
attitude to have and um, is testament to the strength of character that you possess, thank Sarah. You. So, yeah, thank mm. you very much. Okay. I want to, you've got so much going on. I want to talk to you also about your podcast because, my gosh, I hadn't listened to it. Like, you know, I follow you on Instagram and and I love your Instagram page. I love, I get such a laugh out of a lot of <laughs> the stuff that you put up there, your quotes and, and things. And um, But when I listened to it, so it's called uh, Everything, All, all, things, all things, small things Small Biz with yep. Sarah Hales. But there's so much valuable information in there because you're talking to people with actual experience. Yeah. You've got the experience. <laughs> Thank you. But the thing I really love about it is you have Brian on there too at the beginning and the end. Yeah. And I said to you before, you know, actually, Sarah, he is the star of the podcast, not you. <laughs> He's so funny. And um, I just think it's a really unique, um, interesting way that you present it. And yeah. So tell me anyway. That's, oh, well, how, how that all came about, probably a combination of things. Firstly being that I'm not that confident to do so many videos and whatever on my Instagram because I try my hardest and I, I really do try my hardest, but it's not, you know, I'm just not that great at it. So audio where I don't have to worry about the video is probably a lot better for me. But I was also looking, I also recently had a terrible experience where my Instagram was hacked mm -hmm. and I lost my whole social media following. So I was starting to think about ways that I could promote my business differently. And I was looking into putting um, an ad on the radio and it was going to be really expensive. And I started thinking about, you know, somebody like me who spends a lot of time at home with kids and not a lot of time in the car listening to the radio, um, who does spend time in the car listening to the radio, probably a lot of men driving mm. to and from mines or whatever. Um, so I started wondering whether or not that was the best way to spend my advertising dollar. And I'd been talking to somebody else about a podcast. So I started doing a few investigations and it was going to be a lot cheaper for me to start a podcast than it was um, to put an ad on the radio. So I thought, okay, well, I'll give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. And um, the, the podcast is all about, again, I wanted to share my experience um, with starting my small business because I think that if I had have started it, I could have, I could have started it five years earlier if I had felt confident um, in my ability to set up a website or if I had somebody to talk to about it. So I really wanted to sort of share my experience so that somebody else might find the confidence to actually get started on their small business. So how it works is Brian and I do a little bit of a chat at the start about the topic and then we have a guest in and I interview the guest and we've had um, Tori from the small business community and Jen Donovan, who's the founder of Wife from a Bush Business and loads of other businesses. And then Brian and I do a wrap up at the end. Um, but I guess the value for me comes because I talk about my business. That's my point of reference. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're promoting someone else's business. And oftentimes I share it to my community of people and they share it to their community of people and there's that crossover. So we're sort of promoting each other's businesses um, and find new customers that way. That Yeah, that way. But it's... Um, it's been really fun. I've really, I'm really liking it. I, the few that I've listened to, um, so the lady from Buckaroo Boutique. Oh, Jazz, yeah. Yeah, and she was remarkable. And um, the marketing lady from... Yes, uh, yeah, from, she's from Warren, which yeah. is in um, like Central West New South Wales. So, yeah, yeah. and I mean, I've, I've connected with, you know, like 90% of these people I've only connected with through having my online business. Yeah. I don't know them personally. Yeah. Um, but when you sort of start to find your little crowd of uh, supporters and people that you can ask questions of, it's just amazing mm. that we can have never met but really feel that connection yeah. and help each other and be yeah. there to, you know, share and learn from. 
yeah. it's amazing. And Sarah, I think in this era <clears throat> with technology, the way it is, that's made it so much easier than yeah. what perhaps our parents would have. Oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah. I mean, you know, some of these little businesses, um, there's one in particular, which is the Coli Hotel. They were just closed. I follow that now Do because you? of you. And oh. it is so funny. Well, Tom is going to be coming up. I think it's two weeks and Tom will oh. be on the podcast. Oh, so we, we did the interview a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. But they their town only has 39 people. Um, but through Instagram um, and making funny reels, their business is you know, gone viral mm -hmm. and they've had to set up a website for their merchandise oh, and people, wow. they're sending parcels all around the world with Colo Hotel caps. And <laughs> <laughs> but oh. it's, you know, there's another lady who's coming up, um, Prue, she has a business called Hello Hattie and um, she's in a small town outside of Dubbo and they only have a few thousand people in their town, but through promotion on social media and, and not paid promotion just people sharing and talking about mm. their businesses her business my business as well mm. send parcels all over Australia mm. um and I mean think back to our parents or our grandparents how would they ever have been able to connect with customers um far and wide mm. like we can today mm. Mm. it's really amazing I just have a thought Sarah which I'll, I'll ask you about um so like on Instagram and Facebook, you look at one shop mm -hmm. on, and then all of a sudden on your feed, you're getting hundreds, hundreds of shops and, and um, looking up. And I honestly have been caught before. So I, um, there was some shoes on there that I thought, oh, they are actually really nice. So I just went ahead and bought not one pair, but two pairs of these <laughs> sand shoes. And they took forever to get there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And when they arrived, they were crap. Like they, were awful. I, I wore one pair a couple of times and then the soles fell off and oh, they no. just, and so the other pair, they were an awful colour and and I realised there was no way I could send them back because there was nothing. And so I have learned a lesson in mm. that, in to make sure, making sure I go ahead and read reviews. But these small businesses that, you, and, you know, that was probably a Chinese company that just had, you know, some. Yeah, sometimes I think with all of the ads that come, like it's ads that come yeah. up on, um, they can be like a drop ship. So essentially um, a person has a shop front and your order goes to them, but they just pass it on to the factory oh. and then the factory sends you your order, which can be why it takes such a long time. Um, but I think that when you start following the little businesses and you can see the person behind it and really connect with them over time, I guess, through their sharing, um, that's how I like to build a relationship with the business, I guess. I don't really go onto the ads. I'm also go onto their actual page if that makes sense yeah and like the theme i pick up through through what you do like through your through west of the waves and the people that you speak to that that have similar businesses is that customer service is a priority and that you you actually answer all the questions and you um you are you are there for you're actually a human you know, yeah there, human being behind it. um for your customers and that's so important and yeah I think it's important to weed out the ones that aren't. And, yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah. definitely. I have one more question. Yes. So at the end of your podcast, you always ask the interviewee <laughs> what their favourite business hack is. Oh, so gosh. Sarah Hales, what is your favourite business hack? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I think they change all the time. Um, I think mine and – it's sort of funny how it comes about really is because even though my social media following was hacked, I had several thousand, I, you know, worked really hard to build up the community of people that were following the business. And then that was just taken away. But I'm trying to see that, I guess, as a bit of a silver lining because from when I decided that I was going to restart, that's when I decided that I was just going to take my glasses off and just, it is what it is. Mm. Um, I think it's just that honesty of being yourself. Like 
that's probably my best hack is just be yourself and be honest. I don't do all the, you know, makeup and have my hair all blow dried and everything perfect for all of my videos or I never get on there. Yeah. I think the connection that I have with the people who follow my business is probably because most of the time I am out the front in my exercise clothes playing with the kids or having an icy pole or you know, I prefer to just see that people are normal, that they're just like me when they're, you know, all hair and makeup and looking immaculate every time. It makes me feel bad that, that I'm not <laughs> not able to keep that level of perfection. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. yeah. So I think that people connect with you when you're just yourself. When you're real. When you're real, Yeah. yeah. Thanks, yeah. Sarah. Oh, it's okay, Kelly. I want to go shopping. Oh, <laughs> let's do it. I'm taking advantage of being here. Charlie. Brian's taking the kids out so we can yeah. have a full try on. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Thank That's you okay, so no, much. Thank I you really for appreciate you telling your beautiful story. <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much for watching our video. I hope you enjoyed it. And please try to remember to just click on the subscribe button so we can keep you updated with everything that's happening. Thank you.